so fast And I had a million things I could ask Like why'd I go through all this pain so young I know you made me for a purpose And you'll answer everyone Or will I just be silent when I'm standing for the sun The day my time will come I'll finally see his face I'll bow down on my knees Surrounded by his grace And when he calls me up I pray I've done enough I just hope I don't get speechless It's my turn with Jesus When it's my turn I got a million things I could ask I got a million things I could say But I bet I lose my words When I finally see his face So Lord I pray I just praise you. Every time Woo. It you ain't ever heard this one, Shelly. Sorry, guys, I'm a little congested. Even in the times that I heard, Lord, I just praise you. Every time anywhere in my time, I finally see his face. I'm bound down on my knees. Surrounded by his grace And when he calls me up I pray I've done enough I just hope I don't get speechless When it's my turn with Jesus All right, guys, one more song for you. I got to let my phone charge up for a minute, and then we're getting started. So one more song, and then we're going to get started, guys. Boy, they used to call 
call me loco Tell him get that out with baby, I ain't crazy no more Came at the right time, restored me to my right mind Look at my light shine, out there praying with the popo Young black man in America, letting my soul go Told me I'm the light of the world, therefore I'm on O Does that mean I'm perfect? By all means, oh no I fall seven times and I'ma get up Oh So don't let the devil come try to discourage you Let the Holy Spirit come and comfort you and nurse you The devil try to bring up your past to embarrass you That's why God sent a sinner like me to encourage you Since the beginning of time, God has been pursuing mankind. His pursuit is steadfast and unwavering. His love is resolute and unmatched. From the moment of our first breath, we have all been searching for hope. In every human heart, there is a longing for true purpose and meaning. There is a sense that we were meant for more. Our city is filled with people searching for truth, searching for answers. These answers can't be found in quick fixes, self-help books, or our limited ability to understand the meaning of life. Eternity is within us. The kingdom of God isn't a place, it's a people who are pursued by their creator and are found in the midst of their searching. You see, where the pursuit of God and the searching of mankind collide, there is Jesus. The bridge to the one true God, Jesus. The beginning and the end, Jesus. The perfect example of perfect love, Jesus. The one who loves us in spite of our failures, takes our worst and gives us his best, Jesus. The way, the truth, and the life, the one who broke the chains of our sin, the one who has the power to heal and restore, the one who defeated death and rose victorious on the third day, Jesus. No other name is higher, no other name is greater, no other name than the one we celebrate today, Jesus. Good morning, good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. Welcome in, guys. We're in Job 2. Turn with me to Job chapter 2. And we're going to get started this evening. You guys chose it, so here we are doing it. Amen. So, who in here believes that our God is amazingly kind and amazingly patient? 
if you can't believe that, we can't go no further. That our God is amazingly kind and amazingly patient. Amen. If he wanted me to be in charge, like we see in the, the funny movie, Bruce Almighty, then this pain in the you-know-what would be history. Amen. I mean, come on. Satan's given permission to test Job. Um, so what does he do? He wipes out almost all of his servants. He wipes out all of his livestock. He wipes out all of his wealth. Then he unalives all of Job's kids. You know the story, right? Job's being subjected to a very severe test. Satan's been permitted by God to take all of Job's possessions in an attempt to prove that if a man's possessions are taken away, that he will curse God to his face. But what happened in chapter one? This is awesome because in chapter one, we see that Job survived. Job survived that first cycle of tests. Job is left crushed and bruised and broken, right? But nevertheless, he was still full of faith. In all this time of testing, Job does not sin, but is such an amazing believer in the goodness of El Shaddai that he worships our blessed and holy maker. Amen. So is this enough? Was this enough for Job's test? No, because here we go again, and here comes Satan once again, and he opens the door here in chapter 2. Chapter 2 opens with another round of tests, and the first three verses tell us that God again initiates action against Job. In verse 1, it says, Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? But there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil, and still he holds fast to his integrity, although you enticed me against him to destroy him without cause. Satan, the devil, wanted Job to sin against God, and Job refused to obey Satan. So Job was still a good man. Amen? Job had many troubles. Job lost everything. All of Job's children were unalived, but Job still respected God, and Job continued to praise God. Amen? We left Job honorably upright upon a fair trial between God and Satan concerning him. Satan received permission to touch and take all he had and was confident that he would then curse God to his face. But on the contrary, he blessed him. So he was proved an honest man and Satan a false accuser. Now, one would have thought here, me personally, I would have thought this would be conclusive. That Job would never have his reputation called in question again. But as you know, the fullness of the story, Job, is going to be a severely tested once again. It's going to be over and over and over. Amen. Can you just take in the throne room of heaven? Who in here believes you can just take in the throne room of heaven? Who in here believes you can just take in the throne room of heaven? I see a no. Lori, you believe that? Okay. I can just imagine how the good angels have been waiting to see Satan's reaction because he will finally admit defeat. Will he acknowledge that he will, um, that there's a human being on the earth that is totally sold out for the holy majestic ruler of the earth? Is, is Satan going to admit that before God? Because what we see in this picture in the throne room is we see no worship or respect from this created being toward his maker. Therefore, our great God speaks up and challenges him. He asked him the same question as before, whence, co whence comest thou? And answers before from going to and fro on the earth as if he had been doing no harm, though he had been abusing that good man. The supreme judge himself of counsel for the accused and pleading for him asked, Hast thou considered my servant Job better than thou didst and art now at length convinced that he is a faithful servant of mine, a perfect and an upright man? For thou seest he still holds fast his integrity. This is now added to his character. 
Job just got something added to his character as further achievement. Instead of letting go his religion and cursing God, he holds it faster than ever as that which he has now more than ordinary occasion for, but he's in the same adversity that he was in prosperity and rather better and more hardy and lively and blessing God than he ever was. And he begins to take root the faster for being the shaken. So he begins to praise him just as he did when he prospered. He begins to worship him just as he did when he was prospering. He begins to honor him even in the midst of the calamity. Job is still worshiping, praising, and giving glory to the Father of heaven and earth. Amen. Our precious and holy God proceeds to give two judgments. You might not see this, but it's clear in the scripture. He gives us two judgments. One of them is, is how Satan is condemned for his allegations against Job. Well, pastor, where are you seeing this? How do you know that God gave him repercussions for what he did to Job? Can you guys turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9. And I know a lot of people use this out of context, but this is how the context goes. It says, Thou movest me against him as an accursor to destroy him without cause, or thou in vain modest me to destroy him, for I will never do that. Good men, when they are cast down, are not destroyed. 2 Corinthians 4 and 9. So how well is it for us that neither men nor devils are to be our judges? Come on. How many times has somebody meant, has tried to be a judge of you? You've got to be honest tonight. How many times has somebody tried to be a judge over you? This is very important to hold on to because 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 9 is saying that neither men nor devils are to be our judge. Neither men nor devils are to be our judge for perhaps they would destroy us right or wrong. But our judgment proceeds from the Lord, whose judgment never errs is and is, is biased, okay? It's never errs and it's never biased. How Job is commended for his constancy, notwithstanding the attacks made upon him, it says that he still holds fast his integrity as his weapon, and thou canst not disarm him. As his treasure, and they cannot rob him of that. Your endeavor to do it, make him hold it to the Father. Instead of losing ground by the temptation, he gets ground. Well, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Who in here's read First Peter? Who in here's read First Peter? Well, I never knew that Job went into the, the New Testament. Who's read First Peter? What does First Peter chapter one verse seven say? What does 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 7 say? It says that he gets ground. So he, it says God speaks of it with wonder and pleasure and something of triumph and the power of his own grace. Still he holds fast his integrity. Thus the trial of Joe's faith was found to praise, to his praise and honor. To his praise and honor. So we see that God had given two judgments. At first, the devil couldn't. The devil and his, his, his angels and his other men could not be our judges. And that we're to praise and honor and glorify the Father in all of our in, all, in the middle of our circumstance. Amen. So what excuse can Satan make for the failure of his former attempt? What could Satan say to justify it when he had been so very confident that he should defend his point? Well, let's see what he says. Verse 4 says, so Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. Do you not see the arrogance of the devil here? Do you not see the arrogance in how he speaks to Almighty God? He says, skin for skin, and all that a man has, he will give for his life. That's pure ignorance and arrogance. There's a, something of truth in this remark, though. 
You see, Satan and his fallen angels have been around since the forming of the creation. They've had plenty of time to scrutinize the behaviors of men. Self-love and self-preservation are very powerful commanding principles in the hearts of men. Men love themselves better than the nearest relations, even their children they're, they're, that are parts of themselves. They won't only venture but give their estates to save their lives. All account life sweet and precious. How many people are more worried about this life than they are the life afterwards? I hear so many people all the time, you got to live life now. You only have one. You got to live life now. Enjoy what you got. You got to live life now because you can't take it with you when you pass away. You don't ever see a U-Haul behind a hearse. You got to enjoy life now. What happens when you lose all of it? Anybody? You're probably thinking, well, you don't know, Pastor. You don't know what happens when you lose all of it. I did lose all of it. I lost my house. I lost my car. I lost my dog. I lost my business. I, the only thing I had was the clothes on my back. I, I've, I've been there. I've been on the ground. I've been sleeping in dumpsters. I've been sleeping behind them. I've, I've ate out of trash cans. I've ate out of food that people have left over. I've been where it's at. But see, I didn't wasn't worried about the material things. I was worried about how I was going to survive at that moment. I was worried about how I was going to push on in that moment and that was the moment that I tried to to take my myself uh, out of this world three times I'm trying to be careful TikTok out of this world three times because I seen that I couldn't do it that I didn't have the willpower to do it that I didn't have the strength to do it that I didn't have what I needed to complete these tasks when everything was taken You can't sit here and say, well, if everything was taken, then everything's going to be okay. No, it's very true, and that's why the devil attacked his possessions first. See, if the devil can get to you by your possessions, then he's got you already wrapped up in with what he's already taken. See, there's a saying that if the devil can't get to you, he gets to those that are around you. This is very powerful. If Satan can't get to you, he gets to those that are around you because he knows that you are emotionally attached to those around you. So when he can get to them, he gets to you ultimately. We see the same thing here. You see, Satan and his fallen angels have been around since the point of creation. They've had plenty of time to evaluate us. They've had plenty of time to, to see us. They've had plenty of time to know our actions, to know our thoughts, to know our ways. This is why they, the Bible talks about familiar spirits or unclean spirits, that they, they evaluate you, that they study you, that they probably know you better than you know yourself because they have one job to torment you. One job. We ought to make a good use of, the, of this consideration. And while God continues to use our life and health and use our limbs and senses, we should be the more patiently bear the loss of other comforts. What does Matthew 6.25 say? Right? So when Satan says... He says, skin for skin. Has anybody ever been out in a street fight? You say, fist for fist, man. Win winner takes all. Fist for fist, man. We'll leave it right here. Whoever wins, wins. Whoever loses, loses, and we'll move on. I remember when I was growing up in school, it was about who was the baddest on the schoolyard right it was about who was the baddest on the schoolyard but after you guys fought you normally became friends usually really good friends but you guys beat the tar out of each other because you wanted skin for skin you thought your name was tarnished satan says skin for skin he's he's using basically the same argument that he used in the first chapter his philosophy was and is that men are basically self-centered creatures and the reason I brought up the schoolyard is because you were self-centered on that schoolyard thinking you were the big boy or the big girl. 
When you attack them directly, they will give away and they will give up their faith, their religion, anything to save their own possessions. That theory or argument has been fully answered. God has allowed Satan to test Job, and though he lost his family, he lost his wealth, Job remained what? Steadfast in his integrity, refusing to charge God with wrong. Pastor Nick, love you, brother. It's really a very sombering thing to realize that the tests that come into our life are aimed at getting us to curse God to his face. The tests that come to us from the enemy is, is the test to, to, for us to tell God, you're wrong. This is the test to get us to tell God, you don't keep your promises. That, that, that you're not the kind of God that we've been told about. You're probably thinking, what are you talking about, Pastor Nate? Take note of your own life and you're going to recognize it. Take note of your own life. When under pressure, the thing you want more than anything else is to cry out and to protest to God that he is not keeping his promises. You see, and that's where Satan always aims. He has the same philosophy and the same objective today. He wants us to curse God as he wanted Job to curse God. I hear so many people, well, I, my mom died, my dad died, my grandma died, my, my son died, my, my daughter died. I hear it all the time, and I can't believe God would take it. And I hear pastors and, and counselors say, God always takes the most beautiful one. No, God didn't take them. God is not the one that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The enemy took them. Let's get real about this. I'm so tired of the fal falsicity that is being taught. God did not take them. Well, if God didn't take them, then the devil must. Are you guys that soft-centered? Are you that naive? Look through the Bible. And you will never see Satan apologize or ask for forgiveness. Look in your life and see how many times you've asked for apology. How many times you've apologized or asked for forgiveness. Have you ever dealt with someone close who also never admits wrong? Guys, I'm not trying to make this a modern day teaching. I'm trying to make sure that you're understanding and seeing real life situations. Have you ever dealt with someone who, who's, who would never, never admits that they're wrong? Because we're going to see in the future that Satan's going to get on his knees and confess that our precious master and Jesus is the Lord. Just like everybody that can't say that they're right now and say that they're wrong now is going to be on their knees and they're going to be confessing his name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. However, until that time comes, he and his crew are about causing all kinds of evil. So instead of admitting or agreeing to our holy God's evaluation of Job, Satan asked for a change in the rules. Satan couldn't do it on the rules that he originally asked for. Have you guys ever played a board game with somebody and they always want to change the rules in the game when they're losing? But when they're winning, the rules are they're absolutely perfect. There's nothing wrong with these rules. These rules are perfect. But the moment they start losing, they're like, hey, we need to change these rules. I have. I played with somebody like that. So Satan here, he's saying, hey, let's change the rules. In effect, he says to God, you didn't go far enough, Lord. You put a boundary about Job and said I couldn't touch his body. That's the problem. That's the problem. You put your hand and said that I couldn't touch his body. So we got we to gotta change this, this rule today. That's the problem. It's true that a man may give up his possessions. But one thing he'll never give up is his health. Let me go get him again. Let me destroy his health. And he'll give up his integrity and his faith. Stop and think about the words of our great God to Satan. He says, but save his life. His body you shall have permission to afflict. But against his life, thou shalt have no power. Therefore, take care of his life. The original natural.
Amor may be translated keep his soul, but the word also signifies life. Yet in the hands of the destroyer, the life of this holy man is placed. How astonishing is the economy of salvation? It's so managed by the unlimited power and skill of God and the grand adversary of souls becomes himself. By the order of God, the preserver of that which the evil of his nature innocently prompts him to destroy. So in verse 7, he says, So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and stroked Job with painful boils from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a potsherd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Here's the first attack on the body. Some think it's leprosy. Other scholars think it was from the form of elephantiasis, which not only covered the body with running, putrefying sores, but also caused the members to swell up and become bloated and distorted. He's scraping himself with potsherd. This indicates a disease accompanied with intolerable itching. You guys remember the chicken pox? Do you remember the chicken pox? That's what I would almost compare it to. Like chicken pox, a hundred times worse, where the, bo the, the boils were literally blistering and popping and fluid coming out. But it itched so bad that you had to scratch them. Right? Even though you knew the blister was going to pop, even though you knew that fluid was going to come out, you had to scratch it because it itched. Whatever it is, it was rendered Job of a pitiful spectacle, a repulsive hulk of a man, swollen and disfigured and hurting with these running sores. But what does it say Job did? It says Job sat on the ash heap. This was the tradition of Job's people. Well, what are you talking about? A very sad person would sit on the ashes. You're going to see that in Jonah chapter 3 verse 6. You're also going to see that in Luke chapter 10, verse 13. So they would sit on the ashes. Then everyone would know that something terrible had happened. This was their way of letting somebody know something terrible had happened. The reason why his friends beheld him afar off was because they knew that this disorder was infectious. He was not only physically afflicted, but he was also painfully humiliated. He ends up sitting in the ashes, scraping the pus from the sores with a broken piece of pottery. And to cap it all, the one to whom he ought to have been able to turn for emotional support turns against him. And his wife says to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity, Job? Now I'm going to stop here for a moment. Because I do a lot of marriage counseling, and one thing I see, whether it's male or female, is the, the belittling. I don't care what your husband or what your wife is going through. Do not ever, do not ever get to the point where you are making them question their choices of integrity. As a loyal husband or a loyal wife, you should be supporting your husband or your wife and praying for them. We see Job's wife. Remember, when Adam and Eve were in the garden and they lost communion with God, they didn't just lose communion with their God. Remember, I told you they lost communion with themselves. They lost communion with themselves. They didn't know how to handle one another. This is why the man was put over the woman. If you go back to Genesis, you're going to see why the, the woman had to submit to the man. Because this was part of the curse, ladies. If your man's doing wrong, I understand that. There's lots of men that do wrong, but don't belittle them. And especially don't belittle them in front of the children. That's That's bad. Bad, 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 bad. But she says to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? She says, she's basically saying, I can see that, you're, that, that your faith is strong, but my faith has crumbled under this attack. 
So the woman here, she no longer believes that God is loving. She no longer believes that God is thoughtful. She never no longer believes that God is just. She sees this as proof, as many of us have done in times of trial, that God has forsaken his promises, that the Bible's not true. Maybe you have a wife or a husband that's not a believer. But you're a believer. You're trying to bring them into Christ, but you belittle them. Maybe you're the solid one in the faith, but your husband and your wife is the one that's, that's struggling. Do you tell them just to give up? Because I'm going to tell you right now, for the past six months, I've been struggling. And I can tell you for the past six months, my wife, my beautiful wife, is telling me to persevere. My beautiful wife is telling me to hold on to God. My beautiful wife is telling me to seek him. My beautiful wife is there when I need something. I ain't been the easiest to get along with. But are you edifying? Or are you cursing? Are you lifting or pulling down? <clears throat> How many times I have come to comfort people going through trials and they say to me, I tried these promises. I tried believing in God. But it doesn't work. Have you ever said that? Be honest. Because this is getting very close to what Satan was trying to get Job to say was curse God and die. He used Job's wife as an instrument. And just as Eve became the instrument to get to Adam in the Garden of Eden, the assault upon Job's emotional life comes through the wife. He advises him to do two things. Give up your faith, apostatize, and curse God. Actually, in the Hebrew, the word is bless God. But it is properly translated curse because the word bless is dripping with sarcasm. So he's saying, bless God and die. She's clearly suggesting unaliving herself. She's telling him to unalive himself. Could you imagine and if your husband and your wife, you were going through a time and your husband or wife is basically telling you to just, just do it. Get it over with. Maybe if you do it, I'll be in a better situation. It would be better for you to take yours than to go on like this. So poor Job, bound by physical pain. He sits in humility with a disfigured body and suffers from a sense of emotional abandonment by his wife. He's not only physically broken. He's now mentally broken. He's now emotionally broken. And the only thing that's standing strong is his spirituality. He's spiritually alive. I don't know if women fully understand how much their husbands depend on them. Ladies, I'm not sure if you understand how much your husband depends on you. I think sometimes it's taken for granted. I think wives and girlfriends are taken for granted. I think I think husbands often draw emotional strength from their wives far more than either they or their wives realize. I think man's emotional health comes from women, from their, their, their female spouse. Here was a severe attack addressed to the very soul of Job in which he felt his wife abandoning him advocating that he turn from his faith and renounce his God. But now in verse 10, we get the results of this second round of tests. In verse 10, he says, But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Job's rebuke is very gentle. He didn't say, You foolish woman. Right? He didn't call her a foolish woman. He didn't call her anything out of her name. But he says, you speak as one of the foolish women. 
He's not, he's not attacking her. Rather, he's suggesting that this is a testimony lapse of faith on her part and that for the moment she has begun to repeat the words of stupid, foolish women who have the, no knowledge of the grace and glory of God. So in that gentle rebuke, you can see something of the sturdiness and tenderness of Job's faith. In this great sense, he again reasserts the sovereignty of God. He says, shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? There's a reason that he asks that. Because before this, Job's wife believed all of it. So Job's wife had the philosophy that life ought to be pleasant. And if it was not, there was no use of living it. I was just there. I'm not going to lie to you. I was just there. Man, this world would be better off without me. Man, would anybody miss me if I was gone? Man, would anybody even recognize if I didn't show up anymore? I was there. And you know why I was there? And you know why a lot of you guys that say that you've been there have been there? Because that philosophy is widespread into our own day. And a mounting suicide rate, rate testifies to the universal acceptance of this. That if life isn't pleasant, then there's no use of living it. But this book is, to, is given to show us that life is not to be lived on those terms. The reason we are here is not necessarily to have a good time. There are meaningful objectives to be obtained in life. Even when it all turns sour, when the pressure comes, when, when living is no longer fun, life is still worth living. A philosophy that wants to abandon everything as soon as things come unpleasant is a shallow, mistaken, distorted view of life, and it comes from the enemy himself, the devil. Well, I've been taught, Pastor, that once I'm saved, the devil can't bother me. Now that you're saved, the devil's going to bother you more. He don't want you expanding the kingdom. He wants you sitting idly by, questioning everything that you're doing. The Bible instructs us that there is wisdom in many counselors. However, we should not listen to evil advice. Sometimes our best friends speak terrible advice. We should not obey anyone whose advice is evil, right? Go back to Galatians chapter 1, verse 8. You're going to see we don't obey anyone whose advice is evil. Job reaffirms that. He said, should we not take both good and evil from the hand of God? We take his joy and pleasure, the pleasant things of life, with, with gladness and gratitude. If he chooses to send something that is difficult, then shall we abandon the gratitude and, and begin to curse him and protest because life is suddenly different than we thought it would be? The reason we are here is not merely that we may have a good time. Oh, yes, it is, Pastor. The Bible says that we live life and live it more abundantly. You're absolutely right. We do live life and we live it more abundantly. But in this life, nowhere in the Bible does it teach in the Scripture that, that everything's going to be a good time. It says it teaches in Scripture that His grace and glory does give us many, many hours of joy and gladness and pleasure and delight. And it's right for us to give thanks. But do not abandon that when the time of pressure comes. Because that is what Satan wants us to do. He wants us to begin to complain and to protest and to get upset and angry and resentful to stop going to church or stop reading the Bible. That is Satan's whole attack in our lives and it's aimed at doing so. And we do it. Amazingly, when all this is taking place, we see Job now. Job's at two, Satan's at zero. The score is two in favor of Job, but Satan's not through. Remember that he obtained permission from God to assault this man in every area of his being. He not only has taken Job's children and all his possessions, but he also take away his health, all the pleasure of his physical life, and Satan has also assaulted Job's soul. 
and made him feel abandoned by his wife, Satan now proceeds to assault the final stronghold of all, the spirit of Job, the ultimate reality of his life. Look at verses 11 and 12. Now when Job's three friends heard of all the adversity that had come upon him, each one of them came from his own place, Eliphaz from Temanite, Bildad from Shuite, and Zophar from Namathite. For they had an appointment together to come and mourn with him and comfort him. And when they raised their eyes from afar and did not recognize him, they lifted their voices and wept. And each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head towards heaven. So they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. Now we're set for a major argument of this book. And the major attack on the faith of Job comes not through his physical trials, but through an attack on his spiritual relationship with God himself. And I'm going to tell you this, like I've told you guys this before, the five people that are around you will either grow you or they'll tear you down. The greatest attack of Satan came from not his physical, not his wife, not his emotional, not his mental, but it came from his friends. It came through the hands of his so-called friends. I don't know about you, but I've personally experienced all that Job has gone through, but not to the extent of intensity that Job went through it. We're going to learn more about these men as we go through the arguments that they bring forth. And it's obvious that they had come from distant places and that a good deal of time had elapsed while Job had been suffering physically. Word had come to his friends about Job's disaster and they had agreed together by sending messages, messengers to one another to come together at an appointed time and visit Job. So weeks, if not months, had probably gone by while Job is subjected to this severe pressure upon his faith. And when the friends arrive, they are utterly shocked at what they see. They can't even believe their eyes. This, this monstrous, repulsive hulk of a man, could he really be their dear old friend Job? Was this Job sitting huddled in a heap of ashes, scraping himself with a broken piece of pottery, swollen and disfigured, utterly repulsive to look at? Could this be the man that had known and loved? They're shocked by this that their actions strongly suggest that they think Job is on his deathbed. According to Jewish culture, they actually held a funeral service for him that day. They did what was customarily done at funerals. They raised their voices, they mourned and wept, they tore their coats, sprinkled dust on their head, and finally ended up sitting on the ground around Job, observing him in silence for seven days. Did you know that that's the process for a Jewish burial? They had a burial for Job, and Job wasn't even dead. We're going to learn in our upcoming studies that while they were waiting in silence around Job, they came to the conclusion that he was suffering under the hand of God for some terrible sins that he had committed and that it was right for God to make him suffer this way. Their hearts, therefore, were hardening against Job. They had come to comfort him, but they're comforted. They're, they are confronted with the feeling that many of us have had, that there is not much they can say because in their heart of hearts, they believe that Job deserves what he's getting. So the silence probably means that they're wondering how to say this, how to begin, how to put it in terms that Job's going to listen to. And I want to tell you tonight that we all need to stop and listen. We need to stop. We need to listen. We need to think. Let us never forget what we've been shown at the beginning of this book. It is God who is doing this. I, uh, ultimately, and he has an aim in view, and because he does not tell us at this point what it is, we too must suffer through this with Job. We must feel to some degree with him what he's feeling. We have to sense the protest. We have to sense the anguish. We have to sense the emptiness of life. But we have to remember that there's an answer. God does have a reason and it's going to be made clear as the book unfolds. I don't know whether this catches you where Job is or not. Sooner or later, we all come to these times of, of, of trial and testing because in some degree, God visits them upon us. If you're going through such a time such as I am, I think this book will be a great help. If you're not, just be thankful that God has given us this book and be thankful that for the moment at least he has chosen to maintain his protection and his loving care over us. 
If we can take something personally for us today, it is this. For as we've seen, if Satan had his ways, we would all perish. But God has guarded us and kept us. If God temporarily lifts his hands, we have assurances everywhere in the word of God that it will never be more than we can handle. Job proved that. It was never more than he could stand, although he thought it was. Sometimes this is the way that we feel. Sometimes this is the way that we get. We think that God is going too far. We think that God has moved away from us. We think that we're all alone. We think that there's nobody that understands us. We think that everything is collapsing. We just want to be alone. We want to be in our room. We want to be uh, isolated. We think God is going too far, that he's pushing us too hard. But he never does. He never does. Do you know what God's doing in the midst of these storms? This is powerful for anybody in here struggling because this hit me hard when I studied this yesterday to teach it. Do you know what God's doing? And a lot of you are going to say, he's preparing you. He's growing us. Amen. Awesome answers. But what if I told you he's testing your limits? He's testing your limits. And you're probably thinking, what do you mean he's testing our limits? He's seeing where you progress and where you're regressed. He's seeing where you excel and where you decel. He wants you to be on level playing ground. So he tests the limits. He tests the limits. And he tests the limit with Job. And this is what the book of Job will do for us as we go through it. It's going to test our limits of where we're at. It's going to show us where we're weak. It's going to show us where we're struggling. It's going to show us where we need to build ourselves.